here on IKX Classic Network and Universe. Uh, today is so uh, great, you know, uh, to have uh, many people here for this wonderful evening. And uh, I'm Alice Zhang from Peking University. Uh, my colleague, Fu Lan, was from Australian National University here. And uh, today, yeah, it's a special day because this was the last week of uh, May uh, of May of this month. Actually, and this month we have uh, several people who was already get talk on this stage. Uh, but today, yeah, we prior is planning to have a professor at Water was from Caltech, but he has some uh, emergency. Then he gave us this special opportunity. Yeah, for this week, we want to organize a special week, you know, for Shanghai and also for Beijing. Yeah, now the people who is also struggle fighting for the COVID-19 and then many students, researchers and then many professors was blocked in home. So uh, we decided we want to do something for them. We decided we want to, you know, give some uh, support and help. So that's uh, we are going to do today. So we have a three, you know, a young professor here. Uh, Martin Sor, Fan Wang, and the Zhi Hong, they all from a different part of the uh the world, and they're going to talk about you know how to do the uh beautiful research. So uh Martin first uh will go to talk how to write, then Fan will go to talk how to speak, and then Zhi Hong say how to survive in the be success, right? In the lab. So that's a beautiful story we'll link up link that up. And I think we'll have everyone now is you know. Uh, in somewhere you want to do the beautiful uh, results. So first, uh, let me introduce uh, um, my best partner, Martin Sur. Uh, he's uh, from Iowa State University, and uh, he's uh, uh, ICANX co-organizer, moderator. He done a lot of work, you know, uh, with ICANX. But more importantly, uh, Martin is one of the most uh, uh, kind of how to say that the uh, young scientist, the, the uh, most inspiring young scientist, he do not only the best research, he also organize a group, research group very well. Uh, also, you know, know how to teach and how to help the young generations because he come up step by step. And, uh, uh, you know, from, uh, I think that's a long way, you know, Martin going to share some experience with you. So Martin today is going to talk about one more the important uh, technology or skill to all the uh, young researchers is how to write a beautiful paper, right? So, uh, Martin, that's a very important skill. So, uh, the floor is yours, please. Thank you. I, I, I can hear you. I stop sharing. Okay. Yeah, stop sharing. Uh, so, thank you very much, Alice, for the introduction. Um, it is always a great pressure for me to come to ICANX and to reach out to the students, to the young scientists and uh, others who are trying to build out their career. And today I, I want to share with you uh, a little bit about how to get students and postdocs and junior faculty to publish. And um, I'm still a student of this art. And so I'm going to borrow some of my information from a talk given by Paul Hammond way back when I was a postdoc. And of course, by the great mind, uh, George Whitesides and his style of writing, which has really, really in influenced how I put together papers. Uh, to give you a reference, George has published more than a, a thousand papers. Uh, when I was a postdoc there, I was able to uh, publish about uh, 16 papers in a very short window. Um, and <clears throat> to get published, to get uh, a paper, you have to understand what it is. And Borrowing from this paper by Hago, you, they, they argue that the key to publication is you have to take the reader's view. And I'm going to change here to a laser pointer. You have to take a reader's view and, and write for your audience. Don't write for yourself. Don't write what is entertaining to you. And to do that, you have to know which journal or which media, uh, platform you're, you're going into. But once you get access to that platform, you have to tell a story. You have to, to direct your research article but you have to keep focus in, uh, in the paper and present only the results that are dated to it. Nobody's interested to hear um, fiction in a science paper. So you must be guided by your data in uh, everything that you're saying. 
but I also say it in a way that uh, it flows. Uh, and we will discuss a little bit more about what a story is and how you can craft your story so that uh, it has all the elements that makes it entertaining and uh, also informative. Be yourself, don't try to copy other people because if you try to write my way, uh, I, you will find that I have my African influence in my writing. I have my own cultural biases in my writing. And so if you try to tell my story, you're most likely going to uh, have a very confusing way of writing. If you try to tell somebody else's story, it's very hard for you. Also, there's this uh, uh, interesting thing in writing science where we feel like we have to use the jargon. We have to really bring complexity into the system. Uh, I believe, um, and um, I've seen this work quite well in, in other platforms, that simplicity is actually more important than digging into the complex and jargon-rich uh, style of writing. When you make a story very accessible, people from other disciplines can start identifying with your work, and that's where you build citation, and that's how you change the course of science. Make the story very concrete. Nobody wants to publish a, a 300 page a journal paper because I guarantee you very few people will ever read it. Make it short, avoid repeating yourself. Do not over explain something. You're talking to, to your audience, are intelligent people. They are people who uh, are, are no science and uh, they can dig through some complexity and some detail without the, you explaining everything. Uh, and make very clear distinction between your work and others. And this is where, uh, as a student some, uh, or a young scientist, we tend to feel like our work is so important that we forget to uh, acknowledge what other people have, have, have done. And therefore, we cannot really put our work in context into how it, um, it relates to everybody else. And even if your, your discoveries are not very big, do not oversell them. Take responsibility of your work and uh, tell us that it is. Let the story evolve. Let the, the, the importance of the work drive the story we, we, uh, we, we tell. Be bold. Uh, and your boldness can only be guided by your data. Don't just be bold by stretching things a little bit uh, of where the confines of your experiments. Let your data make uh, these statements uh, very clear that Within the limits of a data, this is what you conclude. This is what you found. And this is the newness and the, 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 the uniqueness of that. And the most important thing in writing, be self-critical. Always uh, be a student to the data. As I always tell my student, data never lies. If you follow the data, it will, you will always end up in a place where you will see something that you've never seen before. And that is the joy of science. And it, when you're very self-critical in your writing, the process of writing actually helps you get and gain perspectives that sometimes you don't see by looking at the data itself. But when you try to tell somebody else about your data, by being self-critical, by challenging yourself, you start think, seeing things that otherwise were invisible uh, to you. And so if, if a story is so important in, in writing a paper, what is a story? A story has a, a few elements, and this, to most of us, this is some stuff we did probably in high school or grade school. You need a point of view, you need a perspective, and this is your author bias. We are all biased in the way we tell our stories. But I encourage you to take the reader's perspective. Ask yourself, as you give this story, are you reaching out uh, to, the, to the audience? Are you reaching out to the people you want to uh, get to? Think about the setting, where and when is your story happening? For example, if I showed this as an introduction to my figure, there's a lot of information here. Uh, most of you can recognize this, this figure here, is, uh, or this image here is somewhat related to the movie Lion King. Why? I see acacia trees, I see this topology here, and immediately you know that the story about, I'm about to, to tell you is something that is happening somewhere in Africa. But I didn't tell you this is Africa, but I showed you something that uh, showed that the this, this story I'm gonna tell you has something to be to do with the savannah. And then immediately I introduced two characters in my story and uh, I have these two lions there. So I am going to tell you something related to uh, the, the, these lions. And this is where we introduce the characters. 
The main character appears in the beginning and appears at the end of the story. But in the beginning, they're vulnerable, they're naive. And then as they evolve, they get transformed. They become something new. We have an antagonist. Uh, this, this, this is the, the, the character that opposes the main character. So in most movies, he's a bad guy, but it doesn't have to be a bad guy. In science are the things that make it impossible for you to tell your story. You need to have a theme. Before you start writing, you have to ask yourself, what is the general message? What is the dominant topic you're trying to tell uh, um, to the audience? And then you have also to frame this in the big picture. This is why you take the 20 mile view, although you're gonna tell us a story about a one meter view of the, the work. And uh, these can also come in as a practical lesson from the story you're trying to tell. Center your paper around what is the big thing that you're trying to, uh, to get to. And if you do this, you'll find that that uh, big theme, that general theme, that big topic can be captured in multiple papers, but then end up precipitating into uh, a, a review or perspective that is a, a dis disparate shifting. Every story must have a conflict. If you have a story that has no conflict, there's no tension, it's not appealing to read. How do we create conflict in science? Is if, we we, if you know your setting and you know your, uh, your general message and you identify what is possible and what is not possible to be transformed based on your work and what are the challenges, the difficulties you have to uh, overcome, then you can create a lot of tension in, in this, uh, in your story. And I will share a, 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 a paper we did a while back uh, on, a, on a very general topic that captures this tension very well where you have so much conflict. And, and then if you create tension and, and conflict or something that makes it look like it will not happen, then you have to resolve it. Otherwise the, your audience are going to be very mad at you because they say, you, you, you showed us all these things but you never told us what the conclusion is. And if you don't resolve your con con a conflict, your protagonist, your main character will not be uh, uh, transformed, which is what makes the end of the story very exciting and very fulfilling. And this also makes the story dynamic. Uh, if you have tension, re uh, conflict resolution uh, occurring every so often, you create the conflict, you resolve it, create the conflict, you resolve it, then the story becomes uh, dynamic. And you have to have a plot. And I will show you some of the schematics uh, on how uh, we can use the so-called narrative arc or dramatic arc to organize your plot in, in such a way that if, if you're writing for a paper for uh, a communication, if you're writing a paper for uh, a review, if you're writing um, a, a short review or perspective, if you're writing uh, a book, the, how do you structure these out? And you have to have all these other elements in your dramatic act to, to actually capture that. And by the way, uh, I would highly recommend as you think about what I'm saying here, uh, keep in mind the story of the Lion King, the movie Lion King, because it's so well laid out, it captures all these elements and we can borrow that in, in telling our scientific stories. So what is a dramatica? The most common uh, uh, story or plot is what is called the Icarus or the uh, uh, Freytag's uh, pyramid, where we have a rising action and a falling action. The more balanced these, uh, these elements are, the better the story uh, um, resolves itself. You use this to create tension, to create the, 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 the this is the, the rising action is all about building tension. And then at the end, uh, the, at the top here, you have a climax of your story. The, what is the most important? What is the most dramatic result you got uh, from this work? And then you start validating that work. You start now cooling down. You're sure as the excitement. Now bring us down a little bit, bring us back to reality. And then you resolve here. So the dramatic arc has a, a, a five elements, the exposition, this is the introduction, where you're setting the field, where you're introducing your main character, uh, um, where you're uh, giving us the initial conflicts or defining the problem. You have the rising action, events that occur as a result of the conflict. And then you have the climax at the top, and then you have the falling action, as I said, this is to ease the tension. You have excited somebody so much, now you need to bring them back to reality, and then at the end, the resolution is where you tie the loose ends of whatever it is that you're doing. In a paper, it will look something like this. Uh, the dramatic act does not necessarily have to be a super balance because there is an effective change. If we go back to uh, thinking about um, uh, 
um, what we, we normally talk about in, 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 in uh, scientific terms, if you have an activation energy and the falling action, if there's gonna be a net change, you need this to be uh, maybe lower, not as balanced as in fictional story, but there's a complete transformation, not just of the main character, but also of the reader. So in the introduction, you set, uh, you set the, pro uh, the setting and you get the, the problem. You might wanna bring in some results early in to create that uh, tension. And then you have something on the top that uh, tells the audience, this is pretty good. And then you go, spend a lot of time doing characterization. This is where all the characterization or the validation of the work, did you, uh, did you uh, really do something else that is actually causing the results you, you're talking about or is it actually what you're telling us to? It, it, it is from. And then here, this is where you, you, you answer that question of, okay, it's very nice and interesting, but who cares? Right. Uh, keep keep it in perspective in the bigger picture. And this style of writing is very well documented in this nature and knowledge paper by my friend Raphael and uh, and uh, their colleagues. And also Raphael has a book actually on scientific storytelling. If you're very interested in getting more into this uh, uh, style of writing. But there are many styles, uh, uh, very for many forms of uh, the narrative arc. There is the arcs to riches. These are stories that where the main character starts in a very bad situation. And of course they end up doing very well. A very good example is this old movie here, uh, Matilda. I don't know how many of you have seen it, but these, uh, the, the kid starts in a very bad situation, but they end up actually uh, getting very sweet revenge on over the, 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 the non-caring parent. We also have another example where we have the opposite, where the, 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 the main character starts doing very well and then they end up in trouble. And that's, for example, in the, in the book, Animal Farm. Uh, opposite of the Icarus arc uh, or plot, we have the man in a hole story arc where the main character starts very well, they end up getting into a lot of trouble and then they get uh, re redeemed back at the end. And we see that in Finding Nemo, Alice in the Wonderland, the Hobbit, and you can structure your stories like this too. And of course, this the inverse of this is what we had. And if you wanted to go into, um, um, into um, uh, Hollywood, you can look at the Hunger Games and the, the movie Titanics. And there are many, many movies that are based on the Icarus arc where we have the hero starting uh, somewhere negative, they build up and then they, they, they end up getting this all at the, the end. But that does not mean that those are the only things uh, that we can do where we have a single maxima or a single minima, we can actually have combinations of these dramatic acts uh, where we have something uh, uh, rising up, then they get in trouble, then they get resolved again, or the opposite of that, the Oedipus story arc, or you can get uh, a multiple of these uh, uh, rises and falls in your story. <clears throat> and if you, uh, if, if you look at uh, um, uh, the three, the, a book like The Three-Body Problem, it's a uh, it, uh, um, it's actually a series of ups and downs. There are a lot of conflicts, there are a lot of resolution in, in those three books that uh, it, it really captures this uh, multi, uh, uh, maxima, multi minima uh, story arc. And the other thing you also, I would like to emphasize is that the rising action doesn't have to be a single uh, straight line. A leads to B leads to C. Actually, I always find, and you see this in most of our papers, that when you, you, you write, uh, you create mini conflicts and keep in, hyping the conflicts, you build so much hype or you build so much excitement in the paper that by the time you hit the, the final maximum, the reader is really captured and very captivated by the story. And uh, once you get to that point, then you can you get into the geeky side of the research, uh, get into very deep analysis, you get into very deep characterization. And this is where you might need to use multiple um, um, characterization methods to actually confirm what you have, and then you resolve that conflict. If you want to uh, excite your audience, you can leave them on a high, but it's not necessary. In most scientific work, we end up just resolving the, the conflict and, uh, and remaining there. In movies, uh, the superhero movies, you always get this uh, hero uh, uh, or winning and giving you on a very high. And I, I always believe that this is a way to get uh, to get us to watch the next series, uh, the next movie in that series. And uh, it, it, if you take a, a, a bigger look at this, uh, as you create these loops, you're raising and raising the tension as the story progresses. So you find that the story becomes very dynamic. 
very dynamic not in the, in the in just in the in the plot, but also in how they uh, engage the reader gets in the story. So it's very important if you can that you create these uh, mini crises and mini conflicts and uh, resolve them as you go. And if you want to get more into details uh, on this, there's a very nice blog uh, that captures that the the the, the, the metier.com blog. <clears throat> And, but how do we structure the paper? I always tell my students, and I, 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 I truly believe that uh, this is a, a, a universal, semi-universal way of structuring papers, is you tell your stories uh, through figures. Because we are scientists, we're driven by data. And the easiest way to do that is you need to have a template, a structure that guides your story. In my group, I always advise my students to, uh, to think about a paper as having four figures. And the placement of these figures can uh, drift a little bit. The first figure sets the, the problem, sets the hypothesis. And it's your, as you'll find in most of our papers, we have a schematic as a figure one. A. And then we also have immediately, we put in a result in that figure one. So these here can shift and I'll show you in a minute. Figure one captures your hypothesis, defines the problem and it, it, it creates a conflict and also a, a, a surprise. Uh, then in figure two, we drill on our teaser. We really get into details about, hey, we told you this is going to happen, but let's just show you actually uh, how um, advanced this is. And, and, and this is where we put some of the data that expound on um, the discovery that we made and we hit the climax uh, very, very well. And, 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 and this is where we show you that it really works. But then uh, you argue after that point, where is the science? And then this is where we get into figure three which is always very um, heavy on data and it validates the work. And this is where it justifies why everything else is coming together. And be prepared that these can break up into multiple figures very easily. But at the beginning, we, you, I would advise you always start with four figures because if you uh, use this figure to validate as your, 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 your surprise, as you get into uh, writing it, you'll find where the surprises are, could be. And then figure four is where we resolve everything and we answer the question of who cares. But I would like to also encourage you to pay attention to uh, figure layout, get a good layout and uh, choose contrasting colors and uh, to emphasize where the main story is. And we also pre prepare that uh, the, the figures can actually stretch across this, uh, the original four. For example, figure one might go all the way, even sometimes all the way to the clincher depending on the length of the paper. We might also, uh, also have the figure three break up into two, three or four figures. And then of course the conclusion is where we uh, precipitate everything into um, a, a well understandable concept. And if we write the story right, the protagonist who started here being very naive will show up here as completely transformed. And I'll show you here in a minute. So for figure templates, we have a very simple uh, layout. We make a grid on a PowerPoint slide in the vertical orientation and we have all the six panels. And then as we make the figures, we feed them into that panel. Uh, so for example, this figure, and this is the paper, this is from the paper I'll be discussing here. We lay out our hypothesis here that we're gonna take a piece of paper and we're gonna mold it and actually deform it. And then we create a channel and cover it. And then what this is the, these three here are all on the top panel. This one here is on the second panel across the two panels. And this is here, this is here, and that's how we organize that figure. And of course, you, you can see we maintain that very nice symmetry. And let me give you an example from that paper. Uh, if you look at this paper, this is a paper I did uh, when I was a postdoc, uh, fabrication of low-cost paper-based microfluidic devices by embossing on current stack method. And uh, we I emphasize the figures here because as you can see the statement from this channel, well-drawn figures are the heart of a paper as they deliver the data in the most concise and orderly fashion. This was our figure one. The hypothesis is right here. And I show you right away, we can make the embossing. We can make this product, I'm telling you, and then we can flow water or we can flow liquids through it. But pay attention to the layout of the colors. Here I have a white paper sitting on a black background. And then the choice of the blue and, uh, and red colors here for the, for the liquid is not by accident, is because of the contrast between short wavelength and long wavelength. And also the hypothesis is uh, laid out in a calm color. So we're not uh, boisterous, we're not uh, trying to shoot uh, uh, out of the moon right away. In the figure two, we ask, after we show that uh, the, the, the hypothesis is here, and this is the 
the initial product, uh, it works. We ask the question, did we damage the paper? Why, what does the channel look like? Is it Allegro microfluidics? And then we say, if it's still paper, is it stackable? Can we stack these together? And we show that, yes, we can stack the, 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 the uh, channels together and they work. Then uh, we say in figures, in what, it, uh, what started out as a figure three, but yes, they are stackable. You didn't damage the paper, but are they like regular microfluidics? So we map them to existing technology and we show that these are performing just like uh, uh, you would expect for uh, microfluidic uh, channels uh, where you have pollen and polar liquids flowing and we can uh, see the flow behavior and we can generate drops and do everything microfluidics can do. But then we say, yes, they, they are like regular microfluidics, but they have some special character. The microfluidics have been transformed because I'm using a different substrate, they are bendable. So even when I bend them and loop them around um, a cylinder like this, I can still get flow. And, but if it's paper, uh, besides just getting it to be bendable, what else did we do that was really um, uh, surprising to, to us? And, and we answer that uh, final question of who cares by showing that actually now it enables microfluidics to be transformable. Not only can we get three-dimensional microfluidics by making fluid flow over each other, but actually we have a fourth dimension that we can change uh, the liquid in situ while the channel is still flowing. But you say, well, that's very nice. It's a nice uh, technical um, advance in the field, but really what is the application of this? And what we ended up doing is to demonstrate that because we can uh, control where we introduce the color changing, here we are using uh, um, um, a, a, a pH sensitive uh, liquid and it can change color. And so we just cover half of the channel and only change half of that channel with the idea that it, it initially only that side is gonna be changed, but as it flows, it will, because of the fusion, we're gonna get a color change. And then we can have this actually uh, end up diffusing and changing the, the whole channel. And we can use this as a, as, a, as a timed or dynamic message. That if you get there in time, if you know the diffusion rate, you can tell how long this material has been, uh, how long it has been since this material uh, message was created. And you can see other examples uh, from uh, somebody who, who is familiar to this uh, platform, Julia. I was uh, one of my former students and now she's in uh, Fudan. And she wrote this beautiful paper here where you can actually see the conflicts right from uh, the TOC or a paper from uh, Chuan Shen Du, Sean, who was also in my group, where you can see this conflict, this binary conflict of enhanced conductivity, enhanced resistivity, but you're using the same molecule. Here, Julia used the yin yang uh, to show both negative and positive reliefs. And these ability to create conflict is what makes uh, this, paper, um, uh, this paper very easy to read. The other literatures uh, I would like to refer you to, there is a very nice paper by uh, Tommy Stav and Michael, where they write uh, about the rules of them for writing research articles. They, they advise that you try to pick a very catchy title right away. The abstract should be a mini story. Ask yourself uh, what you should be looking for if you are to search for your own work. And then uh, they give really nice layout on the application of the dramatic arc as you go through the, 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 the whole uh, article where they make the, the layout, the, the, the moves that you need to pay attention to. And in the methodology, it's almost like you have, you're creating a, a cookbook. You should, the, your work should be reproducible. In your results, make sure you compare your results uh, uh, very well, uh, draw contrast uh, where you can, uh, accept where your uh, results are falling short and always give very good summaries. And then at the end of your, uh, your paper, you must answer those research questions, uh, give a very strong uh, summary uh, in your conclusion, and you might find that making a very good figure becomes very important for, for that aspect. And, uh, and they, then they, this paper goes into more details about what each of the, uh, the, the, the components of the articles are going to be. And I'm not gonna read through it. I would recommend that uh, you, 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 you look at that paper and uh, see whether it resonates with you. And the, the other thing is the flow. If you use the dramatic act very well, you'll find that the, the flow in your article becomes very, very clear. And if you avoid jargon and use a, a simple language, then the story becomes uh, very easy to follow. And how did we apply the, the dramatic act in our paper? Uh, the paper I shared with you, we introduced microfluidics. Microfluidics were the protagonist, the paper, 
uh, was some paper properties, not the paper itself, was an antagonist. The paper was, uh, was could be the, the setting, or you could argue that the cross-channel microfluidics was the setting. We created a conflict uh, by using a polar material to uh, flow pressurized liquid and to also use something that wets with water. And then we gave you the climax where we show that the channels can be embossed and they have laminar flow, and also we can stack them. We resolve the conflict uh, by uh, showing that uh, the channel is smooth and uh, they behave like traditional microfluidics. And the who cares, we showed you how they, uh, you can start creating new messages, uh, new transformable messages in what I would actually term as four-dimensional microfluidics. Uh, what is our strategy in writing? I always uh, start writing very early on. As soon as you get hired in any group as a student, start thinking about publication. And as students always think a paper is a thesis chapter, then uh, get the papers before you get the thesis. Publishing after graduation is hard. Uh, and also remember, be a co-author. Don't just be a fast author person. Also try to collaborate with other people. And when you write the paper, it's the easiest way to run data interpretation and analysis, and to also learn new techniques, especially in math and other tools you need to process data. It also trains you in leadership because you have to manage um, uh, what the, how the flow of the data is. And also, papers is a currency in academia. If you're not, uh, if it's not published, it doesn't exist. Remember, a paper is one idea. Don't uh, try to pack as many ideas as you can. Uh, try to visualize the paper very early before you have the data, and then be prepared for the paper to destroy your hypothesis. You may start going a certain way, but then it will change you. I like to engage my students in writing and planning, and I don't wait until they have data, so I encourage all the students to get involved. Even if your advisor rejects your, your paper uh, 10 times, it's okay. You are learning. Don't lose don't get frustrated by the collections you're getting. Actually take those lessons and improve yourself. Everyone can publish uh, from undergraduates to graduate student. I give you examples here of published undergraduate student in, in, in my lab. And if you take this very seriously, it becomes a culture. And we emphasize significance and impact uh, of that. But how do you get started? Uh, start by creating an outline, identify the major questions you need to deal with, and then start composing your figures and do not write the introduction until the, the, the story has come together. And there's a very nice reference here uh, from JFIS Chem Letters that uh, actually highlights how you can uh, actually get started on that. And with that, I wanna stop there and I, I, I hope that uh, you've gathered something from uh, that discussion and I look forward to the panel discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Martin, for sharing this amazing insight of uh, the art of writing. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Lan Fu from the Australian National University. Uh, at first, I would also pass my warmest greetings to the colleagues, the students, the audience, and all the people in Shanghai and Beijing uh, for this um, um, you know, very challenging times. I hope the situation really be, will be improved very soon as life will be back to normal. So with that, let me um, int uh, be introduce our second presenter of the tonight, um, Professor Fan Wang. So Fan Wang is uh, uh, a colleague and collaborator of mine and uh, for many, many years. Um, he is um, now uh, actually leading the biophotonic research group at Beihang University. Um, Fan began his undergrad, sorry, PhD study from the University of New South Wales in, um, and got his PhD in 2014. And in 2019, he was awarded a UTS Ch Vice Chancellor's Postdoctoral Research Fellowship to establish his uh, for biophotonics research team. In 2020, he obtained, he was awarded the Discovery um, Early Res Career Research Award uh, by the Australian Research Council. And uh, then he actually in 2021, he due to his excellent work, he was awarded the Davy Syme Research Prize. Um, in 2022, he actually moved back to Beihang University and started his own research group. And Fan has published over 70 peer reviewed journal articles, including 13 Nature Series Journal. So um, tonight, I look forward to, to hear Fan's sharing of his tips on. Um, how to prepare the academic uh, presentation. Uh, now let's welcome to the stage, Professor Fan Wang.
you muted fan. Can you unmute yourself? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, it's got a problem. Yeah. The internet problem. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, okay. Yeah, my Zoom just broke down again. So anyway, <laughs> um, yeah, sorry for that one. Um, okay, now I'm gonna share my screen. Can you see my screen? Oh, good? Yes, yeah, okay. we can see it oh. now, yeah. Now I can start. Okay, um, hello everyone. Um, it's my great honor to, to join this really special event. And um, yeah, I created yesterday, one of my colleagues in Australia just called me, asked there was the COVID situation, they have lots of chat. And also we, uh, we chat about, I know, just know about uh, one of his PhD students just graduated probably just only one year, but already found some uh, tenure position. So it's really big achievement, you know, as a, a researcher, usually we find some permanent job or tenure position probably five years after we got PhD or some people even 10 years after got PhD. So one year straight away after PhD got a tenure position is really incredible. So I, I asked him like, what's the reason? He told me that the reason is the, the student, she's really good at doing presentation. And uh, she really know how to talk. And so when, when she come meeting with the dean, basically just to, to present him herself like in all the direction and gave, gave the dean is really, really uh, high impressive. So this is probably the reason. And this is also the reason why today I want to deliver this kind of talk. So, um, so the talk title is like magic ingredient of the amazing presentation. So the reason why I did this one just because I think in the presentation is really, really important. And if you think the presentation just like uh, some cooking, so all your knowledge, your result, basic uh, material, and what you needed to do just uh, chop those material and put in some magic uh, ingredient and then basically you can make it like uh, into some really delicious meal. So today I'm gonna try to show you some of this like magic uh, ingredients. So at the really, really begin, I want to just quickly introduce my group and myself. As Lan just uh, uh, introduced, like I graduated in Beihan University uh, in Bachelor and then go to Australia and I go to the New South Wales Uni, Sydney Uni and ANU, Macquarie and uh, lots of place doing postdoc and finally in 2019 got my own group. And in 2021, I back to uh, Beihan University and to uh, develop my own research group. And then now my group uh, have three new research direction. One is on-chip super resolution imaging, one is laser cooling, another is like super characterization. So if some uh, if student or uh, early career like want to do postdoc in my lab, please contact me. And my research area is doing the biophotonics and you may ask that what is that biophotonics because we all know photonics. So photonics is a technology to deal with photons and biophotonics using the photonic technology to deal with the biological sample. And you may think if you already have like tweezer knife doing the bio experiment where we still need to use in the photonics. The reason why is because recently the things I want to we want to study is just really really small, like each of these single biomolecules inside the living cell. The so size is really really tiny, and if you want to test the localized temperature or you want to like a cut in small things, and uh, you couldn't use the conventional knife and uh, tweezer. So this is why we need a photonics technology. And my uh, error specifically on super resolution imaging, optical manipulation, and also single particle tracking. So uh, for the supervised, basically it's a method to see the smaller feature. And uh, currently the big, um, big limitation in this field is like all the method developed by the visible light. So, but the visible light, if you use your hand cover the visible light, you will see the absorber too much. So only red light come out. So this is the problem. So the, the penetration depth of the super resolution is limited. 
And then my studies develop a different technology basis on the near infrared uh, nanoprobe and uh, to develop different kind of technology for deep tissue super resolution. And for the optical manipulation or optical tweezer is a method that can control small particle and just using laser beam. And in this area, the big challenge is like you have to have the refract index mismatch. So, um, so that is the challenge. In, in, because in some biosample, you can think this is the jellyfish, the re refract index is really close to the surrounding water. So it's same with the uh, biosample. When that happens, the light just uh, passed through that one. So you couldn't see that clearly. So that's the limitation. And then my study is uh, like uh, develop some like ion resident effect to solve this one. And for single particle tracking, what we want to do is to develop some way to have really cheap and really easy to find a single nanoparticle. Um, so we did some work just using phone camera. You can see in the value of nanoparticles inside the human cell. And we can also use this one to detect the local viscosity. And we also, upon this one, put in some mirror, we find the self inferencing effect. And then we can have nanoscale sensing the localization of the nanoparticle. So this is pretty much everything um, my research covered. So um, now we're back to today's title. The reason why I want to show you, quickly show you uh, a presentation about my work. It's not only like uh, I want to present myself, I want you to like, uh, Get know about my research. Another one is like I also want to show you example, like share some experience of how I can uh, present my work. And then after you, you look at my presentation, maybe you have some idea inspire you to deal with your one. And then now I got uh, like uh, talking about some detail. How could you prepare your presentation and uh, to uh, to deliver some like a really good communication with your audience. And after today's talk, maybe you have you can have some idea how to prepare. So uh, the first one is like the what's what's the reason why we want to deliver this kind of talk? Like why we want to talk, or why we want to present. So that is the main re, re uh, that is the uh, basically the, the how can what's what's the first drive us to present. So um, as I said, the example in the really beginning I uh, talked. Uh, so basically because the successful is uh, like proportional to the ability to speak, to write, and uh, whether you have some idea. So basically the speak is the first one. The reason of this one, just because um, whether you can whether you can communicate with other people, whether you you could like let other people get know about what you're doing, what uh, what like what's your achievement. So that is way more important than just the, like writing or getting ideas. But of course, like you have to have some idea or something. But if you have big achievement, but nobody can understand, it is also kind of a problem. So therefore, the successful actually is proportional to the three components. The speaking is the first one. So um, I also want to talk about the three phase of doing research. So the first one, actually, as Martin mentioned, the uh, find a project, like uh, also to design some project is so really, really important. So it's first step. And uh, the, second, uh, the second step is writing a paper. So Martin just uh, show us what's the technology. Um, and the third one, basically how to promote of the work. So that is really, really important. Like writing some news or uh, uh, broadcast your work. So that is because when you're going to apply some research funding or uh, apply some position, some prize, also develop some collaboration, also develop some collaboration with company. This also all of them by the relation to how you can promote your work. So um, the students or other uh, junior postdoc maybe think that the three step is for different three uh, kind of different uh, stage of our career. So maybe PhD is doing the collecting data and doing experiment, postdoc responsible for writing paper, and the big boss pretty much look after the promotion of the work. Actually, this is not correct. So as a PhD student or early career researcher like postdoc, actually you have to 
um, you need to, to know how to present your work. You have to do the promotion of the work as much as possible. As I mentioned, it really begin. So that, that PhD student just got a tenure position one year after the PhD, just because he know how to present his work. And uh, of course, because he get like lots of with lots of paper published, really good paper. But another thing is like, you have to know how to, how can you communicate with all the big balls? So, um, so basically, this is just talking about like uh, the. This is what really, really important, and uh, you need You really need to enhance your uh, presentation skill right now, rather than like after you got uh, get in, uh, become a really big boss. And another thing I want to talk about before everything is the aim of the presentation. So you need to keep in mind that basically your task is to make the impression of your research, like, like people to remember your research rather than like just teaching everything. What I mean is like we, we, uh, sometimes when we do teaching, we may prepare a lecture like a, there's a teaching, we have to put a lot of like paragraph here, formula let a student understand. But even like using one hour or two hour, maybe a student couldn't understand all of them. So over here for the presentation, for the academic presentation, you only have 15 minutes. So if the, the people is not in that field, it's in, impossible to let them to know all the detail within 15 minutes because you couldn't achieve this even got a two hour. So this is why the, your aim is to make people remember your research, remember the impact of your research. So keep this in mind. And another one is like when you present, you have to have them self-confident. So um, that is the, the weaker part for the Chinese student. We usually say that like we, we, we could do better in the future, uh, in the future, and we can improve something. But actually what you want to do um, it's like you, you need to present like currently I'm the best. So if you think there are two way to represent the same thing in just a, just a two way. So you can always mention that currently you're the best. Otherwise you couldn't publish that paper, right? So that's the two things I want to introduce when you prepare your uh, presentation, keep this in mind. And then now I'm gonna talk about like, how can you literally, how can you start your uh, presentation or how can you prepare the presentation? Um, so first one, you needed to know that we what, who is your audience? So that is really, really, really important. So before all the talk, you have to ask who is your audience? And uh, I split the, the um, audience into three category. One is your neighbor, one is a faculty colleague, another is a lab mate. So your neighbor is pretty much for the people who don't have the research ground because usually if you ask some like your neighbor, pretty much more than half of them not doing research from like a different era in your uh, daily life. So, um, so for this kind of people, basically some of the community member, maybe from company and also uh, some students, you can treat like a research background free people. And for those people, you need to keep in mind that you, you want to deliver them a really good future. It's more like when you recruit a PhD student, you have to make a pie in the sky. So it's like you, you, you're just selling your, your the, the big future, the bright future in your field. So you can mention that if you're doing photonics, you can see photonics everywhere, exactly everywhere, like the uh, self-driving car and also some like uh, even in the space everywhere. Um, so you needed to make the, the people impression that your research is leading the future. And another one super important is like for those people, they don't have, they, 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 they don't like the buzzword. So if you want to introduce some concept, you try, you have to try to use some plain language. For example, if I, uh, introduce something like uh, using the laundromat equation, analyze the quote the brown motion of the up motion on a particle. Maybe only the, the doing the people doing photonics can understand this one. But if I introduce like, I'm using nanoparticles motion study the localized temperature change. So basically more the, all the people can understand this one. So what I mean is like when you prepare this one, try to use plain language. 
And another one is quite important is how to focus to the uh, impact. Because for this one, you, you didn't tell the, the, your detail of your work. Another thing you want to enhance is the impact. And then you're talking about the in, impact or the, um, the, the, the achievement of your work, try to avoid with like a small error achievement. What I mean is like, so for me, um, some of work I can mention that my I increased my resolution uh, by twice. So, but if the people is not in the field, they don't know. They don't know what that mean. So they, they just say, okay. So so what? Just uh, um, increase the, the the resolution by twice. What's that mean? But if you mention that in the same way, because you increase your resolution, you kind of increase the sensitivity of the diagnostic to, to some disease. You can save lots of people's life. So you can directly say, because of my technology, we save lots of people's lives. So that is same thing, but because when you introduce, when you uh, introduce in different way and the people will know your impact. So for those research background free people, uh, keep in mind that you can introduce like this way. And uh, so sometimes if your neighbor just uh, <laughs> uh, go outside and talking about like uh, you may got a Nobel Prize means like you're a super success. Like it doesn't mean like you can win the Nobel Prize, but like uh, make people impression that you're doing excellent research. So another category of people is we call the, uh, the, the faculty colleague, which is for the research, uh, researcher, but not in your field. So they are doing research, but just no in, not in your specific field. And um, so the funding reviewers and your next boss probably all in that field or all in that category. So for this um, part of audience, you need to remember that you have to ask three questions for yourself. And uh, so this request is really important. One is like why your research is more important or important and not more important. Just because they are all of uh, the, your audience is doing research. So they may think that, well, okay, when you introduce your research, how come, why is really, really important? So you have given them some idea of why you're doing your research and why the, the research funding will be uh, given to you rather than another area. So this is why when you introduce this one, you have to try to convince it's important. And some of the examples is like when some people doing the, the biomedical research, they mentioned that like maybe half of the audience will have this kind of, from the possibility, half of the audience can have this disease. And then you're, as an audience, we probably just uh, listen that clearly. We know like uh, we, we got like 50% um, possibility to get this disease. Of, of course, your research is important. But I'm, I'm not telling that all of you should use this kind of example, but to show you that you have to, uh, firstly, you have to ask yourself why your research is really important. Another one is like uh, you need to focus on to the big picture and the key challenges because um, for those people, they don't know, not in your field, they don't know what's the lo logically what's the big picture and what's the key challenge of this field. You have to tell them what's the key challenge in your field. Summary for them. And uh, also another one finally is your special uh, technique. So if you think like each of us just a game character, we should have a different ability, right? So we did, we, we have the different technology. So you have to emphasize this during your talk. How come, how you are different with other researchers in your field? What is your characteristic? So you need to ask your three questions to yourself and try to answer that in your talk. Uh, when you try to pre prepare the talk for those this category of the audience. And the final one is the lab mate. You probably know this one, just uh, the small error expert. And for this one can be your the paper reviewer, maybe the hard uh, reviewer too, and also the uh, different collaborator uh, collaborators. So for that one, when you prepare the talk, you need to mention you need to mention all the details because it's more like you're fighting with all the people because they know all the small trick in your area. They also know what's the challenge in this area. So you have to give them all the detail and try to answer that is your work really useful 
And uh, most importantly, what is your novelty? So that is quite important. And another one is like, uh, um, why only you can do that? So when you prepare to talk for those audience, don't make the pie in the sky because they will ignore like how can you like uh, introduce this one? And they will only want to know how you achieved this one, whether that is new, whether it's useful for them. So you have to give them the things they, uh, they want. So this is pretty much the, uh, everything for this part. So basically for different audience, you need to prepare like in different way. And another one, I want to, uh, another uh, one, another thing I want to talk about another part is the PPT design. So when the talking about the structure, so I'll, I'll, I don't know how to translate this one, unfortunately. So uh, so this is the like, I, I put it here just because I think it's really suitable. As Martin mentioned that there are some formula for you making some paper. So if you write a paper, you start with the bigger area, like what's the research field you are in, whether you have like really good future, whether it's important. And why is like why you're doing your research? Is that a challenge? Or whether you, you just are following some really hot topic, make a bigger progress. And after that one is how you deliver this one how you deliver, how you did your work, how you solve the problem. And then it's like, so what, after you achieve your um, work, how, like, so what, what's, what's the impact into the, in the research area? So that is formula when you write down papers and uh, in or doing, uh, during our prepare or presentation is similarly really same, but just a slightly different. So you usually start with some like uh, uh, maybe a story or self introduction. And later on, I can show you what's the reason of this one. So you have the st start and so after that one, you can talk about some like a big error introduction. Um, you know, in some of the researchers, they can mix up this uh, start part with the big error introduction and uh, telling a story and also show you the impact of the big error. So that is the ultimate goal. So, but um, it's really hard to make, I have to say. Um, and another one is the key challenge or the hot topic of the area. And after that one is like, what, what did other researchers do for sewing? So that is also quite important that they show where's your novelty. And after that one is how did you sew it and what it can do. And finally give some take home message. So this is the structure of the uh, presentation. And uh, uh, usually we have the three types of presentation, three minutes, uh, seven minutes one. And for that one, it's really short. Um, you have, to, you only got time short to discuss the one work. And for 15 minutes, you can fully introduce one work. And 35 minutes, you can introduce like two work or putting more work and but in one research direction. So, um, for the seven minutes one, I have to say you don't you you have to be careful because you don't have so much time. So don't put too much time to show in the background because I saw some people use the three minutes or four minutes to introduce the background. It's a little bit too much because you then you run out of time to show in your own work. And for the 15 minutes one, you got time to cover the background, maybe just a uh, four minutes, five minutes, and but you need to focus on to the novelty. So over here, you need to like uh, emphasize what is new and why other people couldn't do that one. Um, and for the 35 minutes, you need to be careful. It's the big picture challenge because you have you are summarized one direction of your research. So follow this strand, you have to mention, you have to get really good logic, like the, make a strand to connect all of your research work. And for each of them, you can show the novelty, but because the big picture, you have to show the big picture on which areas or challenge you, you solved. And uh, first of all, we're talking about the seven minutes. So for that one, you can just uh, make a picture. You can just uh, firstly talking about the, the big areas. For me, it's the super illusion. Um, so I talking about the limitation of no uh, normal um, microscopy, uh, image, uh, microscopy method, and then was the advantage of a super resolution. And then I talking about the limitation of the super rise, basically the penetration depth. 
and talking about how this like a problem come from. And then I talk about um, how I solve this one, basically use a full uh, near infrared beam and combine with some probe, you can solve this question. And then after that one, we can do the super rise on living cells through deep tissue, even in some organoid. So that is how I present this one. And for seven minutes, you can prepare maybe like a seven slide. Um, if you prepare the 50 minutes, and uh, it's basically the same as before, only different is over here. I added one page about the small error. So I talking about the, uh, the optical tweezer, big error, got a Nobel Prize, really useful limitations, the uh, refer index mismatch. And uh, so there are some like specific particle and the, the bio particle have some limitation. And over here, I introduced that how for other people, if they want to achieve like higher force in nanoscale, what they did to solve this one. And I also mentioned that was their limitation and then I introduced, I use this method. Uh, after that one gave the first uh, optical dye. So that's the structure, a um, little bit different, but it's generally the same. And if you want to introduce a 35 one, just because you gave some big picture for this one, you know that what I did. So I show in the biophotonics and showing that I'm with three error, how to touch the nanoscale sample, how to see them and how to feel to do the local nanoscale sensing. So that's how I make the strength to connect my thrill of area research. So I also want to show one thing that is the same, like how the idea of how you introduce your work. When you're doing the product, you pretty much always start from really small points, like small entry point. And then when you're doing, you find like lots of like uh, interesting area, lots of paths. And then finally, what you focus on to one specific discover and then you achieve, you solve the problem. But when you present or even when you're writing down some paper, also quite important is like you start with some really big, big background on the field because that one show you what, how your research is really important. And then you narrow down into some specific discover and then try to use your language to solve this one, show your novelty. And after that one, you have to show that one, this is really, really important, give the implications for the field. So that, Keep these two figures in your mind, whether like either in like uh, when you're writing papers or when you prepare your presentation, it's really, really useful. So when you design the one page, the structure, you have two types. One is one figure. So if you put a one figure, it's really easy to tell some challenge or give them background because uh, the audience will focus on onto this is a single page, single uh, figure. And your, another one is multi-figure. It's really easy to do the data communication, data connection, and also compare with the two results. So I'll give you some example. When I prepare this one, this is a single page. So all your focus onto this graph. So really easy to tell the problems. And also if you want, you can make some illustration because you can put many like a content inside of one page. And uh, for the multi-figures, um, when I introduce this one, it's basically because they are step by step achieved. So make the sample, have this one and have this different PSF using this to do the sensing. And finally, you can achieve like a really fast distance sensing. So they are step by step, so you can use multi-figures. But keep in mind that don't use this one. This is not a really good idea. So this is one of my PhD students during the, the um, he graduated, he gave this talk. I said, no, 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 it's too much information. And uh, it's hard to see the connection and uh, too much data. So don't make multi-figure like this one. Um, another one I want to show is like, uh, you have to treat, treat each of figures just like a cover. So every time you finish one paper, just try to make a, make a, cover figure and then you can use this one uh, anytime so all the nice figure i showing you just uh, during my talk is come come from the figure uh the cover figure even even some of the photo you couldn't like uh, you it couldn't go onto the the cover but you still can use them so uh treat each of the figure nicely and finally and it's also most important is the tips for giving the talk so the first of all, of course, is how to start our presentation. So that's the hard part, also like um, really important part. 
I would say because this for this one, if you give uh, if you have a really nice start, you pretty much relax your pressure and also give a notice for the audience like you used already started the talk. Um, so when you come talking about this one, so I know some people may start with, okay, today I'm going to talk about something and uh, maybe repeat the title, but keep in mind that your so the people introduce you already introduce what you're gonna do, right? So the better way is like just tell them some story, like yesterday what I did, I uh, have a conversation with somebody, and I heard I hear one of the, the really great start is like one researcher talking about like his friend got some like a problem in the navigation. Um, like I couldn't remember which is location for different shop or something. And later on, he found like he got some um, tumor in the brain. So this is a disaster, but finally, fortunately, he got recovered. But he said that he should know that before because his research is doing the, the brain science. So he knows that in which part you have some tumor will affect the nav human navigation. So that is like a really easy, to get a story and to bring you in some case to show you that the, how important of her research. And uh, for you, it's a similarly, I'm not talking about all of us should talk about cancer disease, even the quantum you can have way. So for example, uh, yeah, for example, when you're talking about some quantum of life, you can start with some uh, mechanical life study, like a human on chip. And then after this one, you can talk about how the quantum affects the daily life, like, like the, the bird can see the magnetic field and the, 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 uh, how the dogs smell, like uh, the, the sense of the different the, the taste, and also uh, how to enhance the vision of the little mouse. So you give some of the example, don't start with that, start your your uh, research and um, sorry i have to go back behind i want to show that how can you do the practice first of all um basically you can use i can ask you can like uh, hear that for, for um different lecture different people how they present their work and uh, look at the tight also it's really helpful and uh, also you can practice doing the three minute scissors also give some like record by yourself and also look at some MIT lectures. So this is first tip. And the second one is don't use the hand card. I know like lots of people, lots of students using the hand card, but I would say um, if may, please just don't use the hand card because I, I always remember that one of my students when, when um, he presented something and the, during the presentation, he just break, uh, literally break. So start stop there for a couple of the second, and uh, then he like uh, resting on his hand card because he tried to remember everything, all the really good word, all the really good sentence. But if you couldn't remember something, you're gonna be gonna break, you're gonna pause here there, and then this makes you like stop lots of times during the talk. So that is a disaster. So try to don't use the hand card, and also you need to focus on to the logic rather than like a, a one specific and really good words or something. And uh, they would be helpful. And then if you don't like look at the hand card, you got time to look at your audience and uh, you have some eye communication. Um, also, um, another one is like, if you don't use hand card, it's not like you're doing some report or something. It's more like a conversation, like a people to people conversation and make people really uh, comfortable. So to practice this one, really easy, just uh, every week, I believe most of students have the group meeting and during the group meeting, you can just use some bullet points. Don't use the large paragraph, just put some bullet points. Don't use hand card to introduce everything. Um, and another uh, tip is for like um, putting more connection with the audience. So that is really useful because make your talk a little bit of fun and make some high impression. So for example, if I introduce some like my probe, I usually put in this figure because uh, I think uh, some, uh, some, some students may recognize this one, uh, Zhuge Liang. So uh, basically the wisdom or I, I, other ability is really, really high. Only the force is not really strong. So um, usually I, when I play the games, I put in some like a really, really good uh, weapon uh, equip, equipped to, to this character and then solve the problem. And over here, same. So if I gave the nanoparticle, 
uh, into this different type of uh, 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 super technology we can enhance. So this one people will understand and they may get interested in. And another example is like my doing the single particle tracking. I always showing that for super rise, it's just a map, like a Google map. You can see everything clearly, even like in the timetable, you can see the train is coming next day. But um, basically, it's not, sometimes not true, especially in Sydney, because always on track. So maybe the train will not come in within this week. So you have to put some dynamic, really fast report everything. So this is a single particle tracking. So if you use the story in daily life and put it into your talk, and the, the audience will feel really like close to their normal life and really easy to understand. So that's pretty much everything I want to mention today. Um, so I uh, talk about uh, like uh, why we needed to, to enhance our presentation and also like how to design the, uh, how to prepare a presentation and the tips for the talk. So I um, hope you enjoy the talk. And finally, I want to show one formula. So this is how the quality of the communication is like the integration of knowledge, practice, and talent. So if you don't have talent like me, I don't have talent for the speak, but don't worry if you practice more and you already have knowledge because you're doing lots of research work. So you're gonna have the good quality of the communication or presentation. So thanks for your attention. Oh, th <clears throat> thank you very much, uh, uh, Professor Wang, and uh, really appreciate the insights. Um, we move on straight to the next speaker. Uh, so Professor Zi Hong Lei is a professor in the State Key Laboratory of Molecular Engineering of Polymers and Department of Macromolecular Science at Fudan University. Before uh, returning to Fudan, uh, he was an associate, tenured associate professor at the University of Maryland, College Park here in the US. He obtained his PhD from University of Toronto. He did marvelous work uh, with Gina Kumachanfa there, and then went uh, for a postdoc with George where we overlapped. And, and then uh, he is a recipient of the NSF China Distinguished Young Scholar Award. He got an NSF Career Award, New Investigator Award, and many, many others. He is very, very well published, very successful in graduate career and in postdoc, and even in, uh, in, in, in his independent career, great work coming out of his lab. Uh, and his research interest, interests include molecular and nanof uh, nanoparticle self-assembly, biomedical imaging and delivery, and programmable soft matter and plasmonic material. So Ji Hong, I'm not gonna steal your time, uh, I'll take it over. <laughs> Okay, uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, thank Alice for organizing this uh, event uh, during this very uh, challenging period of time. And thank Martin for the warm uh, introduction. Uh, it's really my great pleasure to share with you some of my thoughts on how to succeed uh, in graduate research or how to survive in a research lab. Well, I will not tell you anything uh, scientific, uh, but I'm hoping that uh, the next 30 minutes uh, will be as valued as a scientific uh, lecture. So um, I summarize uh, my, um, what I believe, the key to uh, success for uh, graduate students as uh, follow uh, value, uh, creativity, and time. Uh, first, I consider value as our motivation of doing research. So uh, why we do it? And uh, just for a degree or uh, much more than that, uh, of course, the meaning of value here is far beyond uh, motivation. Uh, second uh, is uh, creativity. It reflects uh, the strategies of uh, doing good science so basically, where are these great ideas uh, coming from? Uh, third uh, is time. It defines the effectiveness of doing things. So how to do it better and how to achieve more during this very limited period of time uh, during this uh, graduate study. So let me first introduce uh, the key uh, one value. So values are um, 
principles, uh, standards of qualities that an individual or group of people hold in high regards. So in another word, value are attributes of uh, the person you want to be. So what type of person you want to be? Um, so personal value or philosophy of life are very complicated. Um, our values are based on many aspects. Uh, for example, uh, family, religion, culture, race, and uh, gender, and so on. Uh, it's very complicated. Uh, since I'm not a philosopher, I'm not really uh, qualified to uh, go deep into uh, this. Uh, but still, I'd like to bring up this. So why? Simply because our personal value play a very important role in shaping the choices and the behaviors of individuals in working uh, settings, in a work setting. Um, this also include uh, graduate students uh, working in the research lab. So a value also uh, exists at a higher level. Uh, similarly, at the level of research lab, core values of the lab uh, defines what is uh, considered right, uh, worthy, and desirable for the team and also for, uh, for graduate students in the lab. So these are some um, examples of core values of uh, some uh, research labs. Uh, for example, uh, Frederick uh, National Labs, uh, National Lab, lab. Uh, core values are uh, accountability, collaboration, compassion, and so on. These are also many other labs, uh, ARMS uh, Labs, uh, Professor uh, Hives Research Lab, uh, and so on. So if you uh, search online, you'll notice that most of the labs emphasize such as excellency, uh, excellence, uh, innovation, uh, collaboration, uh, people, and, uh, and so on. Um, these are core values of the uh, labs. So as said, people with uh, certain values and needs are best suited for jobs that have requirements that uh, correspond with uh, those characteristics. So um, personal, va personal value and the core value of the labs should be at least at a certain level be close to each other. So when a student uh, is placed in the research lab, uh, personal value may synchronize or desynchronize with the core values of the lab. This is very normal, right? So although obtaining a degree uh, itself is important, so we also have to uh, think over whether what the graduate research offers you can satisfy um, your personal values. So if that go against your personal value, the most likely, I would say, you may feel like in prison uh, during these uh, next uh, four or five years of your graduate uh, graduate study. So in this case, I will really, really uh, suggest you uh, reconsider the choice, may find a better a career path. And of course, it is very normal that there might be some degree of uh, difference in values between uh, individuals and the lab. So in this case, uh, this will require appropriate adjustment by students and the lab to maintain uh, positive uh, interactions and positive uh, feedback. So this is why uh, when students join the lab, it usually uh, takes a while for the students to be integrated in the lab. So uh, my advice, uh, the first one uh, is uh, we should, before you really start your uh, project, we should uh, figure out your personal identity and your, your personal, you, you should figure out the puzzle and what's your personal value and before you really uh, go into that. So this is uh, the key one and the key two uh, is uh, creativity.
Uh, the goal of graduate school is to uh, train high level uh, students, and these students will potentially uh, force innovation in science and uh, technology. So that's the goal of a graduate school. So currently in our uh, education system, uh, the graduation criteria or the success of graduate students is more or less uh, evaluated by publications. So basically, how many publications uh, you have and uh, where you publish, the, how good is the journal, okay? Uh, and how many uh, patterns uh, you will fire. I'm not intended to uh, comment on the system. And um, nevertheless, no matter what, the purpose or the goal of students is to publish, publish, and also publish. Right. So for this purpose, uh, students should learn how to promote uh, innovation in science and uh, technology. And for students in uh, a science major, for example, chemistry, uh, physics and biology, so we emphasize a lot uh, uh, science. Uh, there's a difference between science and uh, technology. The science is the creation of knowledge using observation, uh, hypotheses and uh, uh, experiments. And this is different from uh, technology. And technology is basically uh, is implement the science to solve practical problems. For example, development of a device or a process or a, a algorithm or, or something, right? Um, for students in engineering, so we emphasize a lot uh, technology uh, development. So here uh, it's also in easy to distinguish science and technology, right? Uh, for example, a Maxwell uh, equation, so this development of this equation, this is science, right? Uh, you apply uh, these equations to develop something, some new technology, uh, for example, a communication device, internet, and so on. So these are uh, technology. So, um, if you want to design or discover uh, really pure technology, we, we want to have pure technology in innovation. And we have to have discovery of new scientific uh, knowledge. Okay. So uh, how to be creative? The question is how to be creative in scientific research or how to simply how to generate uh, new ideas. So I know that uh, most of the students, including uh, myself, when I was a graduate student, uh, struggled with the same question. So next I will uh, introduce five small tips to creativ creativity. So let's take a look at the first uh, strategy I would uh, suggest is choose creativity. I know, so you're probably surprised why we want to have this strategy, choose creativity. But remember, so when we are kids, we have so much uh, imagination, uh, looking at endings, uh, kids draw, and also the creative toys uh, kids uh, assemble. But after we uh, grow up, we almost forgot or forget, we still have the potential of being creative. Or simply, we are not brave enough to jump to the next curve by breaking um, old patterns of thinking and behaving. And simply because it, there is a risk of doing that. So you jump from here to uh, a gross reason, there is a, a, a big risk, um, most likely. Okay. So instead, most of us prefer to keep doing what we, or what you, or what uh, others have been doing, because this is safe and is comfortable for most of us. So uh, here I would suggest we have to rescue our creativity and keep reminding us, uh, remind ourselves to choose creativity. And this is what I still 
keep doing. So after, from time to time, when I come up a new project, I will ask myself, is it really, really innovative? And can I, can I be more creative to design something completely different or completely new concept? So you have to remind yourself, otherwise you tend to basically follow what people have been doing. This is very uh, natural, okay? So this uh, is strategy one. Uh, so my strategy two uh, would stress, uh, would like to uh, suggest is know your stuff. And people, um, probably people will always tell you uh, think out the box, think out the box. Uh, do not just do a uh, focus on what you are doing. Okay, but I would say uh, think out the box. First, you need a box. You require a box, right? You need a box to break, uh, to be creative. So what does it mean? But in order to discover something new, so you have to know what are the constraints of your field? Uh, textbook knowledge and the state of the art uh, advances uh, in your field, uh, a technology or uh, uh, some kind of uh, devices and so on. So these are the six frames of the box for you to break. But there are many ways to uh, achieve these. So, for example, you can go to a seminar uh, frequently. You can go to seminars frequently, uh, listen to uh, lectures, and read a textbook uh, regularly, and also uh, also read the papers uh, regularly. And so, you should have a habit of uh, reading, uh, uh, for example, papers and uh, textbook. Okay, so only when you know stuff you can really understand what people are talking about otherwise when people are discussing uh, talking about something you feel you understand something if not that's not the truth okay so the more you know the more is possible for you to learn from uh, talks you go or uh, papers uh, you read or discussions you uh, participated so um, this is, I think this is like uh, you re-listen to uh, old sound you listened uh, many years ago. Um, after you experienced server relationships, I'm sure you will have a very different understanding of the lyrics of the sound and even more. Right? So this is very similar in scientific research. Okay, so when you have more knowledge, then you have more beings to sort your new knowledge. And also, it's very similar. Say, your knowledge already in your mind, you can consider that as dots, right? So the more dots you have in your mind, so the easier for you to connect these dots in your head, right? So that's the way, that's the basis for you to uh, generate new ideas. So this is a uh, strategy two I would like to suggest. Uh, strategy three, find a space between discipline, disciplines. So when you enter graduate school, so you may be enrolled in the chemistry, physics, uh, biology, or materials, but we always tend to put a uh, invisible tag on our head and limit our mind on the subdisciplines of our research. The only limit our thinking on the research you are doing, right? But in fact that names of science and departments are historic accident. You can put chemistry in uh, you can name chemistry as another name, right? And you can have a mixture of other things in the department. So there are plenty of unnamed spaces for us to create for create for us to create new field. Okay. So for example, we all know 
um, cell phone and the computer, right? So these are very different things. These are very different tools designed for different purpose, right? But marriage of these two led to revolutionary development of revolutionary uh, technology iPhone. Everyone knows that, right? And the iPhone has already changed our life, I believe. But on the other hand, why Steve Jobs, rather than you or me, developed the iPhone? I think this is largely because of our associative limitations. So basically, including you and myself, we cannot link two things that are far separate from each other. These are two different things. We may not just combine them together. So one strategy of linking probably random things together is important. And how to do that? I think one strategy is to gain some mentor uh, distance. So I, to do that, I would suggest a few things to do. So to keep training yourself to link different things together or link different fields uh, together, right? So first thing is to talk to different people and particularly who are not exactly in your area of expertise. If you are in chemistry department and try to talk to people in the physics department, uh, in uh, say uh, biology department, you are if you are working on say polymers, may talk to people in the nanoscience uh, field. But when you do that, and make sure you guys are speak the same language. Okay, you should be on the same page. And uh, during your conversation, you should keep asking questions. Be stupid. Okay, only in this way, you will be able to really learn something from others. Okay, that's first. And second, is to capture crazy random ideas, use a notebook. And ideas come very quickly. And they will also disappear in seconds. So in this case, uh, when you say read a book or uh, listen to a talk, quickly write down a few notes on your book, on your notebook. And also afterwards, reinforce your ideas with conversations with uh, other, uh, uh, either uh, your advisors, or uh, uh, students, your colleagues, and so on. So last thing we can do is to embrace randomness, okay? So including myself, when I attend a conference, I tend to walk into sessions um, I'm familiar with or closely related to my research field. So why not try a different thing? Walk randomly into a conference room and listen to a uh, 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 box uh, completely in a different uh, field. Okay, so that's one thing to do that. Or you, when you read something, you should also uh, challenge yourself. Okay, come up a few words or come up with some ideas that are completely different from uh, this paper, this talk. Okay, we should uh, keep training ourselves so we can uh, do better and and try to learn how to link things and link concepts uh, together. Um, so this is uh, strategy three. And strategy four, I would say, is uh, to stay focused and uh, keep going. But keep working on your uh, draft uh, values, uh, work on your experiments, and test your ideas and the hypothesis relatively quickly with an uh, acceptable level of uh, certainty. So what I do is I always encourage students to design uh, proof of concept experiments. And ideally, these experiments should be very simple and very easy to complete. complete. Ideally, say in a few days or in a week, and you can finish the proof of concept experiments. So afterwards, you can uh, design more precise experiments uh, to is collect data, right? So you shouldn't spend, say, eight months or even a year to test 
whether an idea will work or not. Simply because you just do not have much time, okay? And uh, also go back to your advisor, collaborator, and colleagues regularly to get more feedback, ideas, inspiration, and confirmation. So based on my experience, and for students graduated from my research groups, uh, uh, including uh, in Maryland and uh, in Shanghai, right? So most of the successful students are very good at this. Keep basically pushing and keep coming to you and ask questions. Say, if I'm not revising his paper, uh, say after a few days, if you lock my door, okay, is there anything I can do to help you uh, say, okay, to, to work on the paper and so on. I think this is very helpful, okay? And also uh, try to stay focused and say no to a lot of things. Okay, during graduate school, there may be many uh, disruptions, but try to say no and focus on your research. Okay, so if you don't, uh, during graduate study, if you don't fail regularly, I would say you are not taking enough challenges. So we should take challenges and fail regularly, so every week, every month, and so on. That's very normal, right? In your thinking, you are think independently. You are very creative. Okay. So that's uh for my last uh, strategy I would like to suggest is to switch off your self critic. So don't let others including your advisors grind you down. So very often when you come up uh, probably a naive uh, idea and people will tell you, okay, this is a very crappy uh, idea. You shouldn't try that, okay? So I would suggest if you come up with something, read and talk to people and try to confirm and to establish uh, your, your idea and afterwards and keep working on that. And it, insist on uh, the idea, okay? So there are many uh, uh, examples of uh, Baldo's comments uh, that nowadays uh, sound like a joke, right? So here I will just list a few uh, uh, to entertain, entertain you guys, okay? For example, uh, Ken Olsen, he's the founder of Digital Equipment Corporation, and he said, there's no reason for any individual to have a computer in the home, right? This comment, this comment came the year after Apple uh, introduced the personal uh, computer, okay? The second uh, is by uh, Thomas uh, Watson. Uh, he is the uh, uh, chairman of uh, IBM. And he said, I think there is a world market for maybe five computers. So now look at my home. I, I, I own uh, the whole world computer. I have more than five computers in my home, right? So it's like a joke when you look at that, these uh, comments. So my last example is uh, by uh, Western Union. Uh, Western Union invented the, the technology of telephone, right? But at the beginning, uh, the write internal memo as a follow. So this telephone has has too many shortcomings to be seriously considered as a means of communication. So this device is inherently of no value to us, right? So you look back, these comments are just funny, right? Ridiculous, okay? So when you do research, it, you should build up your confidence and uh, switch off your self-critical, okay? When you have really uh, good ideas. Uh, key three, uh, time, okay? Uh, time management. Uh, the duration of your PhD study uh, is usually four years. And uh, first year, more or less, uh, uh, depends, right? And if it is a direct program, uh, you have five years, right? Uh, it, first year is very much cost intensive. You don't have much uh, time to uh, work in the lab to do experiments, right? 
and in the fourth year and you will pretty much will spend at least one semester to write up your thesis and also to find a job and so on the many things you need to do right so you will lose another uh, half a year so uh, out of these four years you will end up with uh, about two and a half years to really work on research right so your time is very precious it's very precious and your time is your most valuable uh, resource for you so you have to ask yourself is your time getting you where you want to go so in this case you, it is really important for you to manage your time wisely uh, during these uh, two and half year uh, scientific research. Okay. So since your time is precious, so my first strategy would be uh, improve your time effectiveness. So keep in mind that there's a difference between uh, efficiency and uh, effectiveness. It's like you play uh, a dart throwing game, right? So your goal is to hit the center, center point, rather than uh, throw as many as uh, darts in a period of time, right? Similarly, uh, in your research, is your goal to say run ten experiments in a day, or is your goal to run say two experiments a day, but achieve the same even better outcome to better results uh, during these uh, uh, one day uh, uh, experiments right so often the way to achieve your goal is not uh, by doing more but by doing a lot fewer low value tasks right so you shouldn't waste time and shouldn't like really make your work less uh, make your time less uh, effective so bearing these uh, in your mind, I would suggest a, a few things uh, you can do, right? So first, you can uh, routinize tasks you don't care much about or not a big part of your uh, your life. Uh, for example, when you get up in the morning and uh, you say spend 30 minutes on makeup or you, you spend say two hours uh, for your lunch, or 30 minutes or 40 minutes for uh, for coffee and so on, right? So you try to routinize those tasks, okay? And plan your experiments with outlines immediately after your proof of concept experiments. So I'm still following a uh, George Whiteside's approach, right? So I would suggest the students to look at George Whiteside's uh, uh, published paper uh, in advanced uh, materials. Uh, the title is how to write a scientific paper, right? So th this, in this article, uh, he is not only talk about how to write, but also talk about new concept, how to use outline to guide your experiments. So uh, in this case, you may not directly write a, a really a full outline, but you should have a clear outline or clear paper your mind when you run your experiments you need what kind of figures what kind of uh, supporting information you should have a plan before you start writing okay and uh, also learn to set priorities of different tasks and uh, um, save you some quiet time without any disruption and for example nowadays a cell phone is so popular. I, I know that students may check emails. I look at the cell phone, say every 20 minutes, uh, every 30 minutes, and uh, and so on, right? It's very destructive when you are running experiments or read uh, an article, right? So try to turn off, at least mute your cell phone while you are working, reading, or doing something important, okay? And also um, try coming early, say come at 8 a.m. or even early, you have disruption-free morning. So even before people start working, so you already uh, have this time, quiet time to finish your most important uh, task. So that's a, a, a few uh, 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 suggestions I'd like to uh, suggest 
uh, to uh, improve uh, basically um, effectiveness of your time. Another strategy, uh, strategy two, I would like to uh, suggest is uh, ask your time, ask your time. Okay, so uh, when you go shopping, right, we know that uh, price of uh, product usually will go down, right? Will go down uh, depending on uh, how many you will purchase, right? Say if you buy one. You may get 10% discount. If you buy three, you get probably 30% of a discount, right? This is very, uh, very normal, right? So uh, similarly, so for your research and uh, creativity seem to follow Newton's law of uh, inertia. It is a tendency to resistant, resistant changes in a state of thinking, right? So you prefer to, you have some, when you work on something, you shouldn't uh, uh, pause it. You, you should keep it going and keep the flow uh, 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 moving, right? So now you can have really, really uh, very concentrated uh, thinking and for you to, to work more e effectively. So similar to shopping, so you'd better batch your time. So for example, batch works uh, for experiments, for uh, instrument time, and for meetings and for emails. And here particularly, I'd like to emphasize emails, right? So uh, including myself, I always feel like I'm so important, okay? I keep checking my email, say uh, every 15 minutes, say 30 minutes, this is very destructive, okay? So if possible, I would suggest you patch your time for checking emails, say twice per day or even say once per day. And only during that period of time, you will look at your emails and reply your emails, okay? And also patch similar tasks. So you should preserve a relatively big chunk of time for really, for what really matters, say writing a paper and preparing uh, presentation slides and so on, okay? I put meetings with colleagues Lunches, exercise, meal, back to pack, uh, whenever possible. These are less important, right? So you should give these uh, activities flexible, a little bit more flexible, right? Uh, only after you finish those important tasks, you will go to say exercise, have meal, and so on. And the selective multitasking, and also uh, and depends on, on on people, right? Some students can do multiple things at the same time, run multiple experiments, uh, but depends on uh, individuals. If you feel this is very destructive, I would still suggest you only focus on one thing at one time, okay? So that's a uh, uh, second strategy. Okay, so my uh, third strategy would be uh, delegate uh, responsibilities. So you may feel that uh, your advisor is delegating tasks to you all the time, right? Okay, you do this, you do that. Uh, in fact, yes, you are right. Uh, that's most of advisors uh, are doing, right? And, but you can also do the same thing, right? Uh, I would suggest it if possible, train an undergraduate student or train a master student, depends on your level, to do tasks that are less uh, so uh, that you, your highly trained brains is least engaged, or is not necessary for you for you to do it, right? For example, as shown in this scheme, right? So what you can do is you train a student, and you analyze the skill level of the student, and analyze the requirement of the skills for the experiments, and you analyze the importance of your tasks, right? And then you can decide how to delegate a responsibility, either fully delegate the task to the student or delegate the task, also monitor the progress of the student or do not delegate uh, uh, tasks at all, right? So it depends, depends. And another uh, thing you should pay attention. Um, so we are human. 
you cannot be good at everything, right? So I would strongly suggest you to collaborate with your colleagues. So only in this way you can be uh, more productive and you can use expertise of other students so you can basically have a win-win uh, situation, okay? So that's uh, my strategy three. And strategy four, uh, liberate uh, constraints, right? So I think uh, like most of people, I also have this problem. I tend to put things off until another time. Now this is uh, natural human behavior, okay? So how to overcome this uh, problem? So what I usually do is to liberate uh, constraints, uh, for example, uh, set deadlines and the leverage pressure, peer pressure to stick to the deadline. So you set deadline, okay, we are going to have a, a, a draft or some time. So you have to uh, come up the draft uh, before the deadline. Right? And schedule time with colleagues uh, instruments in order once, uh, for example, SEM, TEM, and some other measurements, right? Uh, say you have TEM tomorrow, right? You have to prepare your sample today. Otherwise, you basically, you have to cancel your, 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 your time slot, right? And schedule meetings in advance to force you to have results to share, okay? You can set up a meeting, okay? Uh, send an email to your advisor, so, okay, I'm going to, I like to book a meeting to discuss my research, okay? Discuss a paper or something, right? So in this case, you will force yourself to prepare a draft or prepare your results for the discussion, okay? And also uh, keep your collaborators posted if you are collaborating with uh, your colleague, right? So um, very often, and in my group, for example, uh, when we, so when I talk to students and the faculty in another department and uh, uh, set up uh, collaborative projects, so after a few months, if I don't keep asking, students will basically place it aside, will forget it. So you don't want to be, uh, basically people think you are not, you cannot be trusted, right? Otherwise, no, no one will uh, want to collaborate with you in the future. Right? So you should keep your collaborators posted from time to time and tell them what's your progress, what you are doing, what results you have and regularly, okay? So that's uh, strategy three. And strategy five is, it's so simple, okay? Avoid the technology, uh, technique uh, related uh, headaches, right? I had uh, two very bloody experience uh, before, right? One is my computer was stolen uh, during our group meeting, right? That was uh, my third year of graduate study. Right. Second is I spilled a whole cup of tea on my uh, computer, right? In both case, it wasted me at least three, four weeks to redo my work. And some of them even cannot be uh, recovered. I just lost those data uh, forever, right? So I'd like to suggest you to do uh, the following. Uh, first, put the drinks no less than 20 inches from your laptop. Uh, no exceptions, okay? Just so make sure you won't spill anything on your computer. And also back up your data regularly, say every week or depends on your, your, your pace. So what I do is I, now I usually back up my data, say every other week. So either say by external hard driver, hard drive, or uh, previously I also use a job box. I feel it's, it's very uh, useful. And I don't use uh, Baidu Drive a lot, but I know this Baidu Drive is free and you can probably also consider that as well. And also I would like to suggest do not back up your data. Or save your results uh, for a long period of time on public computers. It's very often people do not know what are those folders and how long folders are, are, are kept there. So sometimes accidentally they may delete your data, right? So do not back up those uh, uh, data on public computers. 
Okay, uh, these are uh, my two cents uh, on graduate research. Uh, I feel like you may not agree, right? But I do hope that uh, uh, among these uh, uh, suggestions, one or two of them can be useful for you. Um, with that, I'd like to thank you for all your attention. Okay. Thanks. Okay, thank you, Zhi Huang. Very nice talk and a very, very nice experience sharing. Actually, you, you share your bloody experience. Let me, you know, remember my bloody experience. The 15 years ago, I visited MIT, but that morning my computer was stolen. So oh. I want to deliver a talk, <laughs> but I don't have a computer. I don't have data. I have nowhere to find it. Yeah. So that that's the exact, uh, exact. It's very painful. Yeah, yeah, terrible. So uh, everyone has a blood bloody experience. I think you know your suggestion is very important. And uh, three point uh, old members. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, COVID here. I have this good habit. I keep writing everything down here. Okay. Yeah. Let's welcome everyone back to the panel discussion. And uh, I think you know. Uh, firstly, I want to uh, ask the questions from uh, all the audience because why we have this special event, you know, especially for Shanghai, we prepared like two or three weeks ago. It's because COVID-19 now gets things worse, right? Yeah, a lot of people was really worried about us. So uh, that time was Shanghai, now it's Beijing. So got many, you know, queries come here. So first, I, I want to, Zhi Hong, you are in Shanghai, right? Yeah. yeah. Uh, keep uh can you give us a brief report for you know shanghai yeah <laughs> <laughs> okay just a um, yeah, sure. um i think the situation is getting much better uh at least uh, we can uh walk in our neighborhood uh at least uh for a few hours every day and uh um if you have uh allowed uh, a card allowance card you are able to drive outside uh, to buy some stuff. I think we are close to uh, success, okay? Uh, the university may open uh, in a couple of weeks. Okay, that's very good. Uh, okay, that's very good news. I got to know that the university will open, reopen. And how about the students? Yeah, so... Uh, uh, students are still, uh, most of them stayed in, in dorm. Um, they can, uh, I mean, for most of them, they can go downstairs and walk for a couple, uh, for a certain period of time. Um, and, uh, and some, uh, also we allow students to go home, right? Depends on the needs. And uh, indeed, uh, some uh, graduate students uh, prefer to go home and work at home, right? Um, but it's hard, I know, like, uh, because uh, most of students are locked in the dorm for, uh, uh, almost two months is, yeah, is, yeah. is hard for mentally. It's a very challenging for everyone. Okay. Yeah, yeah, it's a true. Yeah, so for anybody, you know, if you're blocked for, you know, two months and uh, looks like, you know, yeah, short of a food or something. Yeah, that's really hard. Okay, yeah. yeah. So that's very nice for Shanghai. We at least we hear that, you know, good news was coming and, uh, you know, better we can see Shanghai reopen in soon. And uh, how about Beijing? Wang Fan, could you share us something happening uh -huh. in Beijing? Good? <laughs> yeah, uh, generally it's fun, but just uh, inside university, nobody can come out and nobody can get in. Um, we, we call it a closed circle. So um, I wish it won't be um, go to that more serious than the current situation, but currently it's fun. And uh, uh, inside the university, um, just have normal life because like you you still can play basketball you still can like go to the supermarket yeah so yes at university is fun just uh, they call it closed circle so the student couldn't go out that from the uni yeah so um yeah and for us it's a big problem because then uh because I am building my building my lab, <laughs> so <laughs> refurbish everything. Everything. So basically, we have to stop the plan and the waiting for like uh, then they allow the builders to get into the building. So and uh, yeah, for the students, they couldn't do um, or some of the, no, they couldn't do experiment. So every all the experiment has been stopped. So 
then all the projects have a little bit delay, but yeah. Um, but for normal, normal life, it's, it's fun, yeah. It's not like uh, totally isolated. It's like you still can go to somewhere. But inside, for the people inside university, they couldn't get out, yeah. But only for Beihang University, it's not for, I'm not really for, for Beijing University yet. Yeah, 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 yeah. I was to talk for Peking University, okay? Yeah. <laughs> so from my side, actually, I have a responsibility to tell everyone that in Beijing or in, uh, you know, Peking University, the campus students do very good. Yeah, so uh, I, I think now we could, we didn't close the lab. So, so uh, yeah, I could get into the campus, but students there was also, you know, can continue for their experiments. And uh, cool. they have some trouble as for they couldn't eat inside. So they all need uh, to ah. go outside for eating. So, but that maybe, yeah, I, I think also caused some kind of, of interesting story because normally the grass, you know, all blocked. Yeah, the student could work on the grass or somewhere. So now they can step down. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> they even can see that it's there. Yeah, so uh, that that's uh, maybe that's a, a, a oh, uh, yeah. surprise, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I saw some people put some tent on the grass. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right, right. Actually, normally they couldn't do this, you know. Yeah, the cup will capture that, but now they say, okay, you can enjoy. Yeah, so. Uh, yeah, that, that's something. So now here, uh, I think in Beijing, most of the university or the campus was like this. Yeah, the students are safe inside and they have, uh, you know, they, they can work or somewhere. Maybe some lab was closed and uh, some lab now closed, but they're not short of our, you know, food. They're not short of our anything, you know, usage for this. So it's good, but... Uh, we don't know which can, what time, you know, this COVID-19 can be get off, but uh, yeah, but should be not that long time, yeah, uh, because Shanghai now already, you know, has some kind of latest reporting is can reopen, you know, in two weeks, so I think, uh, yeah, we, we should follow up. Right. Yeah. <laughs> we'll be okay. Martin and Len, yeah, this was a good news for you. And this <laughs> very, very much. Thank you for yeah. everyone outside China was really kind of worried about this because I got many, many, you know, people sending messages and sending emails. So I have two. Yeah. And uh, today we uh, we do have some questions. I, I keep short. Okay. Yeah. Because uh, Len almost. Uh, you know, 12 o'clock. <laughs> okay, yeah. So, Martin, there were one uh, student was asking you. So, Martin, could you remember? So, your first paper is a reject. Oh, uh, yeah. So, what kind of, <laughs> you know, experience that time you have? Because some uh, young students, uh, yeah, they want to know. Yeah, now you have uh, many publications. Uh, so, your first paper is smooth or not smooth? Uh, did oh, you remember? It, it... The, 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 that's uh, that's where the what uh, uh, Zihong was talking about becomes very important. Persistence and resilience. I I remember the first uh, paper I put out as a, as a, an assistant professor, and I had met an editor at a conference in Boston, and I told him, "Hey, I'm working on this big idea." And like uh, uh, Fan was saying, when you're talking to somebody about an idea, you build that, I really like that cone. You give the big picture, but then you have a very small uh, specific idea you're telling them, and then you show them the impact. And so I, I kind of laid out the full uh, project to them and I got a little bit of excited. And I wrote the paper before it was ready to go out because I felt the, the, the editor really liked it. And of course, when I submitted the paper, it, it got desk, desk rejected, it didn't even go through. And I said, the editor-in-chief wanted this paper. What is wrong? But then we sat back and we said, are we sending the right message for that journal? And it was very clear when we went back to our story, our paper, we realized that that was the worst journal to send that paper. It was a huge mistake. And so we wrote the paper, the story we had, the data told us where to send it. And when we sent it uh, out, uh, uh, we ended up waiting another, probably we ended up working on that project for another four, four and a half years. 
And that is when now we got the paper in advanced functional material. But the original work we had at that point would never make it to advanced functional material. It was all surface science. It was low impact. And unless I had done all the work, nobody would connect the big idea I had with what I had, uh, I had told the editor. So uh, it, it, it always write your story. Uh, rejections do happen. I, for example, even the, the most recent uh, paper I'm working on right now, it got rejected. I, I wrote a paper, I believe it's very important and uh, I'll be very open, I sent it to Jax and the editors will not even hear about it. And, and, and then Jax is a general uh, chemistry paper. It's not very physical chemistry. So then I take the same paper and I send it to Angavante, which it has the physical chemistry bit. Guess what? It's showing up there as a VIP article. So it, it, even the rejections do happen every day. And uh, it, no matter how experienced you are, even with George's group, we used to get rejected all the time. So, so it doesn't matter who you are. Uh, it's a question of, are you lined up with the journal? Uh, number two, did you tell the story to the audience that uh, mm -hmm. participant to that journal? And is the data tight, right? Is it a good fit? And once you find that fit, um, and sometimes we have our own bias, uh, especially when you're a student, your advisor may like certain platform, you may like certain platforms. And uh, if the story is not aligning with the journal, you will be rejected no matter how good the paper is. And, and, and when you get a rejection, don't take it like it's a bad idea. No, 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 they're just helping you make the story better. Take it and improve it and send it to the right people. That's yes, that's right. Yeah. yeah. So I will tell my students your words because if he's just rejected, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You feel that's a black thing. Yeah. So, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, have another question. Uh, uh, okay. Uh, Lang, maybe this question is for both of you, uh, Fan and you. Yeah. Uh, actually, uh, you know, uh, Lang, your English is so beautiful. Uh, you know, it's amazing. Yeah. Actually, Fan was a follow. <laughs> but was for fun English was very good too. I mean, you know, does you have uh, you know anything to share shortly with the student how to get their English? Yeah. So most of uh, the students, you know, want to give a presentation. Yeah, they couldn't. They, maybe they didn't get to the fun, you know, structure. But the first thing they say, okay, my English is poor, so they destroy the whole thing. <laughs> I, I think from, from, from Fan's presentation, he made it very clear, practice the key, right? I, I think for a student, if you're not very uh, uh, familiar with presentation or you don't do it often, you have to do practice. Um, trying, I have to tell you, now I don't need, but when I was a student or when I was a postdoc at that time, when I go to a conference and, not, and uh, if I deliver a talk and all this, I do a lot of practice. I time my talk and I really make it accurate so that uh, if it's a 15 minutes talk, I make it 12 minutes and I, I practice so many times. I think there's no shortcut. You just need to be, <laughs> and once you really familiarize what you're actually talking about and you, you really start to really understand how to control your time and all this, and that becomes much easier. So there's just, yeah, I think there's just no secrets just to practice. <laughs> okay. So firstly, actually, I, I'm thinking line, you are really a genius. You know, you have a special talent in the language. <laughs> you have special talent to give the time. No. Right? <laughs> and also you have to just talk, right? So you, if you yeah. are in the, in the lab and, you know, if you have group meeting and all this, you need to really be able to open and talk. You start with more, you know, discussion, and then when you go to meetings, conferences, if you have an idea, don't be afraid. No one will think, think you're silly. A lot of people is actually don't talk because they, they feel like they might say something wrong. I don't think there's anything wrong. <laughs> there's no silly ideas that you just need to speak out. And the more you say, the more confidence you get. 
God, that's the best or worst, you know, no silly, you know, kind of question to the new silly, you know, conversations. Yeah, just to be brief enough, okay? Yeah, so fine, you was encouraged like this, right? Yeah, I, I actually totally agree with Len that we need to do lots of practice. Actually, my my go to Australia, my English is really, really poor. Len, maybe Len still remember, but actually I meet Len in 2010. Uh, so that is 12 years ago. So <laughs> so uh, 10, 10 years ago, my English is really poor. And even now it's not as really, really good. Um, so the reason why I still can talk, use English, like doing the presentation and something, just because uh, it always say I have to survive. So I have to talk. <laughs> so I have to, to communicate with other people with uh, English. And uh, for, for myself, because I'd like to learn lots of things. So I chat with lots of people and the different background and chat a lot. So that's how I practice my, my English. And I do present lots of times. I know. This is kind of like even 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 um, in foreign country. I also see some Chinese students that they they pretty much in the big Chinese group. They they didn't got much time to to use English talk. So even when they graduate, they still have some problem in English. So I I encourage I, I I just want to mention that if you I mean it doesn't really matter whether you are in in in, in China or in foreign country. Um, just uh, speak more and uh, communicate more. Even for now, it's like uh, if you got any friend, like foreign friend or your supervisor's, um, your supervisor's friend or something, so foreign people, you just chat with them more. So there's no any, like there is no no any short of it, like I mentioned, uh, just uh, talk more, communicate more, and uh, also do practice more. I mean, for, for the presentation things, it's like you, you have to practice like uh, quite a lot of times. And uh, way back to 10 years ago, every talk I prepared like a couple of times, like same as Lan doing timing things and yeah. Oh, yeah. okay, very <laughs> great. We remember your equations, right? Knowledge, practice at the time, and many, many times, one more time. Yeah, that's very good. Okay. Hi, Jimong. Yeah, let's say I came to you. Uh, the so questions. Actually, in your talk, there are many things, you know, to take away, right? Yeah, I take back. So uh, you have a one very important word. Once you have a good idea, you just uh, go, you know, in a short time, you know, to do it, right? Yeah, to make it. Let me remember this was a very famous kind of uh, short words was MVP. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mi minimal available, you know, uh, prototype. So if you just want to do something, you use a short time to make it, see the prototype. Yeah, that's very important. I think many students, you know, the bad habit is, okay, I have a good idea, but I need to learn this first. I need to learn that, uh, you know, first. Then after three months, okay, idea was gone, <laughs> right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so think about it. you have like a two and a half uh, years, right? And how many ideas you, how many hypotheses you can test? So if everyone take, uh, it takes uh, three months, then that would be crazy. Yeah. So, but that's really often happened, right? Yeah. yeah. Many, many students, especially in you know, the first year or second year. Okay, I'm not, you know, we are prepared. I'm not, you know, good at the equipment. I'm not this. I'm not that. But you know, waste the time. I see now, yeah, we should tell them, okay, just go to the bench. <laughs> to make it. So it looks very roughly, that's, you know, doesn't matter. Just make it as your prototype, right? It work mm -hmm. or not. Yeah, yeah. This, this, this is very important. I think many, I met many of the students, uh, I see this was, uh, you know, the really bad habit, but they got used to this. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So we should keep reminding students, right? Um, make your experiment, the first experiments, as simple as possible. Right. Yeah. As simple as fast, right? Yeah. yeah. So in a shorter time and then make it a prototype. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So I, that's your MVP. <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> oh, thanks. Yeah. Okay. So
so uh yeah uh very good very very great okay let me share my screen i still have a uh, you know gifts for you okay <laughs> uh, yeah so uh come on let me share this okay can you see this okay yes uh thank you very much uh actually today was a very great talk and uh thank you martin yeah so you have a uh, yeah our certification <laughs> one more yeah and uh, fun yeah thank you yeah you have this one especially was uh, prepare the academic presentation last time you was our young scientist awardee right yeah so <laughs> you you have several and uh Zhi Hong, yeah thank you for in such a uh you know difficult time you also you know deliver this nice talk the su uh, success in the lab i think everyone uh, well, follow your keywords, three, you know, valuable things, yeah, to go ahead. Okay, thank you very much. And uh, next week is a big, big, big event, because next week is our 100 volume, our 100 weeks celebration. So we have our Professor Cherry Kagan uh, to get on the stage to deliver her talks. And uh, we also have our big group, yeah, 10 people from 10 different, uh, you know, areas and 10 different uh, places to enjoy this great event. So celebrate the 100 volume. So next week, yeah, I will see you on June 2nd. Okay, yeah, uh, see this nice picture. You all will enjoy it. Okay, thank you very much. That's the end of okay, today. See you.